Okay, so let me put on a different hat. Pretend that I am Professor Pietro Taravacci, uh, who will join us. Uh, yes, I have a nice beard. <laughs> uh, who will join us as soon as possible. He's busy with academic bureaucratic uh, stuff at the moment, uh, and he apologizes for that. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, what we need to say is that uh, today is a very precious day for us. Uh, thanks again to Rachel Blau du Plessis for accepting this invitation that inaugurates uh, the academic year of activities of SEMPER, the permanent seminar on poetry that this uh, university has organized, hosted for a number of years now, that has become a permanent feature, a permanent workshop, uh, focusing not only on poetry, but on translation of poetry. That impossible translation that uh, will occupy our reflections uh, uh, this morning. Together with Rachel, we have uh, Renata Morresi sitting over there, and Annie Ballardini here, the two translators of her poetry into Italian, and my colleague, uh, co-coordinator of this day, Professor Andrea Binelli, whom you know very, very well. <laughs> um, thank you also, Rachel, for allowing me to cut her curriculum to sort of a slaughter <laughs> level. Uh, she's got a curriculum that is dozens of pages long, uh, and she also kindly sent us uh, what she calls a short curriculum, which is single-spaced over three pages. Uh, so let me just say that Rachel is, uh, wouldn't you know, a feminist. Uh? Yes, that's my connection. I take uh, all the responsibility for that. Uh, and her feminism is spread all over her poetry and her essays and has inspired at least my generation uh, deeply and uh, provocatively as well, both as regards uh, issues having to do with uh, keeping our societies together in somewhat civilized ways uh, and making sense uh, of our work as people who work in literature. What does it mean to use words? Uh, we do have a high responsibility in using words. Uh, that, of course, uh, intersects uh, with gender issues, uh, genre and gender. She has uh, inflected these two meanings uh, throughout her work uh, in uh, highly significant ways. And, of course, she is a poet. Uh, she is one of the most prominent poets of the second half uh, of uh, the past century and the first decades of this one. Uh, with her feet, uh, I would say, with, uh, may I say, Bob Creeley, whom you know is uh, deep in my heart, uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg, Zukowski, that older generation is there, and she's responding to them, responding to them in ways different from the ways that somebody like Adrienne Rich, for example, responded to, but of course, uh, collaborating also with her work uh, of gendering uh, poetics uh, and politics uh, for all of us. And of course, she's an academic, uh, an essayist, I've already said. Um, and I will stop here, because she was kind enough to tell me to stop here. Professor Emerita at Temple University in uh, Pennsylvania. and. Uh, the writer nowadays uh, of the American long poem. She will talk about that tonight. Uh, we will try to understand what happened to that long, long poem that Whitman donated to us, uh, who tried to make sense of what American literature is uh, over these uh, couple of centuries. So thank you, Rachel, for being here. And I'll hand over the Man. conduction of this morning to Sure. Yeah, thank you. Morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Prego. 
just a brief premise in Italian. Adesso iniziamo quello che appunto vuole essere un seminario, dunque il più possibile interattivo e sebbene utilizzeremo la lingua inglese eh, per facilitare la partecipazione di tutti, eh, le domande possono essere formulate ovviamente anche in italiano, soprattutto laddove si tratterà di discutere le traduzioni eh, di eh, Renata e Anni, d'accordo? Di Morresi e di Ballardini. Eh, in quel caso naturalmente le domande sono legittimamente formulabili anche in italiano, laddove si parli di sfumature semantiche difficili da rendere eh, ovviamente in una lingua che non è la eh, lingua madre. Eh, se per eh, timore, imbarazzo, qualcuno di voi non se la sente di formularla in inglese, lo faccia tranquillamente in italiano, d'accordo? Eh, questo naturalmente vale non soltanto per gli studenti. Puoi parlare italiano e stai tranquillo. <laughs> ok, benissimo. Now I, I become official. Um, and first of all, let me thank you, uh, Giovanna, for uh, organizing this beautiful uh, translation workshop. I know all the artwork which is behind these events, and so I'm deeply grateful to her. I'm grateful to Professor Travacci for organizing SEMPER, uh, Laboratorio uh, Seminario, Seminario Permanente uh, Sulla Poesia, which is the container, if you like, of this uh, event in particular. Um, and of course, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and for being here. I'm also glad to see many faces of our students. That's good news, well done, uh, and welcome. And I'm quite certain that the workshop will live up to your expectations. Always proud. <laughs> okay, so um, I will briefly introduce our two guests. As you know, I deal with translation uh, more than anything else within this department, and therefore uh, it is my duty to introduce two uh, translators. Uh, the two um, uh, translators of Rachel's uh, uh, Blow the Plessis uh, poems. Okay, let me start from there. Renata Morresi, uh, she has a PhD in comparative literatures from the University of Macerata. Uh, she was a visiting researcher at the University of Austin in Texas and she qualified as professoressa associata in lingue e letterature anglo-americane. Uh, is that correct? Is it? <laughs> lingua o lingue? <laughs> lingue. Lingue, ok, correct. Mm. È bello, no? Il plurale è sempre bello. <laughs> lingue e letterature anglo-americane. She has an interest in women's studies and Afro-American modernism, and she is a poet, an English teacher, a translator, and an essayist. Uh, possibly <laughs> and a feminist. <laughs> No, no, not in this order, not in this order, I can sense. <laughs> okay, she uh, translated some of Rachel Blow de Plessis' drafts into Italian, and this is what she's going to talk about later on today, okay? Annie Ballardini, mm -hmm. she holds a PhD in English from the University of Verona. Uh, she also holds a Master of Fine Arts from the University of New Orleans. Uh, which means jazz, <laughs> and a diploma as interpreter and translator from the University of Florence. Yeah. Well done. She has published books of poetry. And a degree at the University of Trento. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't apply, no. <laughs> it's true. It's true, probably the, my, my curriculum hasn't been updated. She graduated quite recently. Right. After getting a PhD, she needed... Okay, we are not going into that, are we? No. Okay. Um, beside that, she has published books of poetry and her poems have been collected in anthologies, uh, published in Australia, the United States, England and Italy. She's a translator uh, from English into Italian as well as from... Italian into English. Uh, she provided, for instance, Dino Campana and Quasimodo with an, uh, with an English voice, pardon, and uh, she translated Hank Laser and Laser. Rachel Blow Laser. Duplessis Laser. with the S or the Z? We don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> What's your opinion about laser or laser? <laughs> I prefer laser. Poets have to be lazy. Come on. <laughs> This is the end of it. Okay, um, so let's start with uh, our guest, Rachel. Um, I would like to start, f if, as one of it may be, from the form and structure of drafts, which is the text you're going to work on today. Form and structure, which are definitely peculiar, and uh, my stress, my emphasis would be on these um, ongoingness, on this idea of a poem which doesn't actually want to end. And if you can tell us something about that, uh, just as a means to present it to our audience, and possibly to ask also the questions whether uh, that is also the idea of a poem which doesn't want to end uh, has perhaps to do with your position regarding women and literature. Thank you very much. Okay, as is typical with these events, the question that was being asked and the question that I am re re uh, ready to answer right now are totally and completely different, <laughs> which allows me to think on my feet. Actually, I will talk more tonight at five in this same room, right? In this room, yes. Okay, so just be back. And more about the structure of drafts. Basically, uh, to, to summarize very briefly, there are elements of poetry in the contemporary world often deriving in, ang in English American literature from people like Whitman, who seemed never to end, from people like Creeley and Oppen, who are important figures for me, who uh, did not who cr who created a seriality a poem of serial structure not serial that you eat like granola but serial s e r i a l just to make sure that we're on the same page which were poems that took various positions but no uh, final argumento no final um, and therefore were very interested in ongoingness and in in never ending. So there seems to be a tradition in US poetry right now, and I will really talk more about this in later today, of poems that, that deliberately do not want to, to finish, although they may close at various punctual moments. They may come to various resting points. And for me, one of the, um, the features of this is a sense of perpetual gloss or um, self-commentary that isn't necessarily solipsistic, but more of a sense that the, w the world continues as such and you're constantly being asked to be responsive and in a responsible relationship to it and to words. So one of the things I say, and I will say again, is that the mysteries really are it and is not me and am, <laughs> I am, but it is. And that, of course, leads to a very interesting problem in translation, which I would like to mention, which is in, in English being at this moment, at that juncture, a Germanic formation, we have he, she, and it. But you guys don't have that. Not, re not in the way that it becomes separated. So therefore, the, the notion of being as an ongoing, transformed, metamorphic thing that I, that I use it a lot, like to me, and we also, in English poetry, I use English. English and American, to me, there's no division. It's an ang Anglophone poetry all across the world. Of course it's different, but it's also using English. So when I say English, I mean American. And I don't mean that in an imperial sense, God knows. Um, but at any rate, so in Anglo-American poetry right now, often there is a floating it. That is, their referent is very um, floaty. That is, it's not precise. 
necessarily. But the problem is when you have a, a, your language being inflected, as if it's very accusatory, your language being inflected with um, things like nouns have to agree with adjectives, we can have an adjective and a noun and they, you can't really tell. You're not sure and that's deliberate, let's say. But you have to make the referent word explicit and that becomes very interesting as a translation problem. So there's two translation problems just even from the, um, the, the nature of the language, which is what you're dealing with in terms of translation. You're dealing with both sameness and difference. Our languages are very similar because they're Latinate and all of that. You know, we, our syntax, but immediately there's a problem. And I'm going to segue into the problems. Okay, I'd like to sort of start with by saying that translation is interpretation in the sense that um, it's like a literary performance in the sense of a musical performance. Everybody would accept that a pianist, one pianist is going to have one interpretation and another, another interpretation. And that depends on a lot of things. This time frame in which this pianist is, the training that this pianist has had, even the hand size, of the pianist, you know, some ha some pianists have a very small hand, some have a larger hand, they have to learn the finger, you know, how to finger and so on. So it's a performance, and we understand a performance in music as, a, as an interpretation. You know, Giza King's interpretation versus Schnabel's interpretation and so on. But we, it's very hard for, even when you're smart about it, to accept that translation is a kind of version of the original. It's not, a complete and total replica and can never be, but that's okay. It's not a law, it's both a loss and a gain. That is, you can have losses, um, but you have, people in general have a harder time crediting that a translation is a reading of a text and a reading at a certain time and place with certain parameters of language and so on. Um, so the work is, ex the, my work, when it's been translated into Italian and into French, has been extended by the translation and interpreted. It isn't, I don't feel a loss, I actually feel a tremendous sense of, of a gain in a reading of, by other people of this text. And that is like, a little bit like drafts being ongoing. That is, a version is ongoing into another language. Um, and the, I, I think I would like to stop by quoting just one thing that I say in one of the poems. Translation says the unsayable twice, once in another language. Mm -hmm. Because when you get to a certain point in poetry, even if you like clarity and explicitness, which I do, the poetry becomes a kind of unsayableness. Therefore, first you have the poem that is unsayable, and then the translation is also unsayable for a second time. And for that, I'd like to pass along to somebody else. Who would like to say something about it and is and and the problem with English and American and? Um, it's all right. Do it. No, oh, you can go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not sure, but starting with my um, theories, I mean, with theories, with my ideas, or with examples. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, would you prefer an example, theory, or my views? Um, surprise, surprise, the three together. <laughs> so can we project um, one of the, the first, the first, um, excerpt from one of the poems, one of the drafts um, I translated. Oh, later. The, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, you already got this. Okay, wonderful. Um, so did we mention the title, the titles of some of your work? Drafts, okay, and which is plural, <laughs> nice, <laughs> and it's well, very, <laughs> uh, 
uh, evocative, but uh, un unstable. I mean, um, how? Okay, in Italian, I translated it into die bozze. This is called dieci bozze simply because I chose ten drafts. I mean, long. They are long poems, and they're part of this long poem project. Okay called Bozze. I mean, I had to argue with the publisher for a while because he didn't like the title Bozze. Um, no, because Bozze seemed, you know, like a working title, and but also it didn't sound nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sound too, too rough. Mm. Or maybe you can call them studi, minute, Okay, so more more poetical uh, Italian words. Of course, always mm, I'm, I'm always quoting mm, uh, because yeah, what's poetry? What's poetical? You know, well we can go into that later because the theory of translation is also a theory of poetry somehow. I'm also a poet, by the way. Did we say this? Okay, oh, thank you. Um, okay. Um, so, well, um, I'm, I'm not going to say a lot, just let's just read. This is uh, draft 111, 111. Arte povera. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, which is Italian. Well, <laughs> the, well Rachel actually. Um, mm, Rachel's poetry is imbued with um, many layers of languages. So many different languages are there. And this awareness of translation too. Okay. Um, so this is section four. Sorry. Section four. Um, this here, you, you can read um, on the left, my first draft for this draft. Okay. Was, you know, just giving it a try. E se dopo tutto quanto una faccia giusto, un elenco, casa, libro, tazza, infisso, figlia, studio, cani, persi, apple. Easy, with just a list of words. Mm. So, <laughs> um, but not so easy. Well, first of all, because as Rachel has just said, you have to, well, um, specify the um, gender of this one, one just listed. So either you say uno or you say una. Mm. And here, of course, the translator has to choose. Of course, I chose una. She's an author. I'm a woman translator. So una. But since in Italian, the masculine is usually used in a neutral way, I mean, this immediately becomes a political statement, somehow. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, okay. And then the list. Casa Libro Tazza in Fis, okay. House, book, mug, window, all right. Figlia Studio, Cani, Persi, Apple. Daughter, dogs, gun, desk, apple, with trademark. I don't know whether you can read there. There's the TM trademark. Okay, I changed the order. In my first draft, I changed the order of this list. Uh, so um, the dogs <laughs> came after um, the studio, the desk, sorry. Um, why did I do that? Why did I feel the need to do that? Any suggestion? <laughs> Alliteration. Yeah, but it was going to be there anyway, wasn't it? Figlia studio, cani, persi, apple. Yeah, it prosody, Italian prosody. So usually in Italian prosody, the weight of let's call it sentence, come, 
the, even if this is a line, of course, uh, the weight um, goes at the end. Okay, so when it is packed, it go of words, it goes to the end of the sentence. So it was like you know, mm, automatic prosody in Italian. Figlia studio cani persi apple. Okay, and and Rachel, she wrote to me. You might read the comment <laughs> somewhere. Um, you've reversed the order. <laughs> okay, and you have not put the trademark sign TM by Apple. Okay, so I went back to that, and in the end, the result is Figlia Cani Persi Studio Apple TM, um, which is, I mean, why not? Why didn't I choose that in the first place? Mm. Uh, but there is this sort of automatism in the language we speak, um, which is economic in many ways. You know, we usually speak language to communicate or to deceive <laughs> or, to, or to, to express, but um, you know, in these cases, as a translator, you often tend to think that you want to communicate. But actually, you must be very aware of what you're doing, uh, which is not communication. You didn't write a message. <laughs> you're, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, well, this is my first point here, which is um, pragmatical, but also theoretical. Uh, the translator sort of sort of has to um, become aware of the linguistic habits and to, well, to face them and to crush them <laughs> if necessary. Um, yeah, that's... that's I'm going to say yeah. thing, though. I want to say that, however, it is also true that I gave per final permission to, the to each of the translators that it was their translation in their best judgment, which is also another point, and that the intervention of someone who partially knows a language, Italian or French in, these, but in my case, uh, might be a problem for the translator if the, tr if the original, I'm the, tar I'm the sort of the original and, sh and you're going into the target language, the, you know, Italian. If the original language person thinks she knows too much, <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> no, I, I really need to say something. Um, Rachel uh, was was um, I initially had uh, to put together a thesis at the end of my studies here in Trento, and I wrote down a list of female uh, poets, American female poets, and among these um, female poets, we had Rachel Blau Duplessis, and uh, Professor Covey said, yes, let's choose Rachel. So I was sort of led, I didn't really know Rachel that well, I knew some other American poets better. And um, uh, the way that this enormous thesis uh, developed was thanks to Rachel's corrections. I really felt safe. If on one side, you know, it's very bad to feel corrected, you know, you see, oh, this doesn't work, you know, oh, you chose the right, uh, the wrong term, I'm sorry, not the right one, you know, you would like to hear the right one. And, uh, but in the end, uh, I was really like, thanks, Rachel, you know, it's, it's really impossible. How can I wade through this material on my own? Because it is very complex. I really needed to say. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you all. Okay, just a um, couple of words about what this uh, initial discussion um, and my consideration, okay, something which I obviously address uh, my students about. So the point is um, from the point of view of the content, you have a movement there, okay? You have a poetic movement which is going from the room of the poet outside and the idea of dogs, which are gone, it's emblematic in that sense, okay? The movement out of the door, you have filia, 
studio, cani, perzi, gone, okay? And then comes back. You have the desk and the computer. So from the point of view of the content, that order shouldn't be modified, okay? If you really want to focus on that, you shouldn't modify it. From the point of view of the phonetic pattern, which in poetry is absolutely important, the order chosen by Renata is much better, in Italian, of course. It really sounds better. On account of what? Per siepol becomes one word and one beautiful sound, which kind of counterbalance casa libro, tazza and fiso, this idea of having two objects going almost together, okay? So there you have Figlia, studio, cani persi, apple. Though uh, the um, distinction between persi and apple disappeared, which makes sense and is beautiful. So at the end of the day, my suggestion is not to do one way or the other, just ask yourself, what should I give privilege to now? the phonetic texture, the phonetic pattern, so the euphony of it and the eventual reaction, the outcome it has on my readership, or the content. Should I keep this movement from inside towards the outside and back? And that is really up to you. Prego. <laughs> You're most welcome and you can speak any language. Um, uh, Molto logico la sua scelta iniziale, perché la poetica italiana si basa molto, venendo dal latino, si basa molto sul ritmo e sulla fonetica. Mandestan diceva che la lingua, ita Mandestan diceva che la lingua italiana è dadaista. È una sua affermazione. Per cui si costruisce molto sul suono e sulla fonetica. Ecco la prima scelta istintiva, la radice culturale italiana. Sì. Nella lingua inglese, invece, il paesaggio, l'altrove, il movimento è predominante. Anche perché la lingua inglese ha in sé una um, fonetica totalmente diversa. I suoni sono diversi. La Um, rima è più facile nel senso che è un suono molto modulabile l'inglese non per niente nella canzone è bellissima um, quindi io penso che abbia toccato un nervo profondo addirittura inconscio della poesia inglese e italiana of generalizing and to attaching qualities and attributes to languages, which is always dangerous. But it is true what she pointed out, and I definitely agree with her, that our, uh, the phonetic texture of the Italian language differs from that of English uh, on these grounds. And it is true also that the symbolism, which is usually attached to certain sounds, uh, differs again. Uh, the outcome, the effect of certain sounds on in Italian or on an English readership changes significantly. So you have to be careful and as a translator you're entitled to make such changes. Absolutely entitled to do so. Because the literary and stylistic tradition within which your translation will be received is important. And is the one you have to be careful with. Okay? Absolutely. Here we go. If you have Yeah, this, is, this was our aim, just only to have a, an informal <laughs> conversation, interesting <laughs> possibly. Yeah, really. What I understand of that is when you translate this, you're con you may be making zones of substitution. For example, if, there was a z if there's a zone of intense sound in English that you can't quite get at that moment into the target language, then perhaps you displace that little zone into another line quite close by and you will get 
approximately the effect of intense sound, but you are using the words that are more idiomatic to the target language. I, that has happened constantly within the translations that that we have done, and also with the. Tra I remember many discussions with the translator into the French, who uh, with this book that Annie has brought, which is um, by Oxemarie Brouillon. Um, okay, so that's one thing, and I I agree. On the other hand, and if I'm understanding correctly, and I may not have gotten your point correctly, one of the features of of the difference of poetic translations in English as opposed to a Romance language, is there is a great difference within our poetic traditions. This is where Americanness comes into play in a certain way, which is that, as I was noting before, US poetry has worked, especially like my sort of general zone, a more avant-garde zone, has US poetry has worked on depoeticizing, detranslating, unsublimating, and to make poetry not so poetic. And this is, this is, of course, a clash with literary traditions that have been experienced um, high, a higher level of uh, rhetoricalness, which you might find, for example, um, in somebody like Swinburne or in Wordsworth, uh, earlier British, okay. Even John Ashbery recently died at 90, a good long life, beautiful life in poetry, whose work is very rhetorically swimming <laughs> forward all the time, has not just a certain layer level or zone or am ambience of rhetoricalness, literariness, but also that same question of uh, you know uh, d uh, the diction and uh, so on, that even the padding that you get in Ashbury sometimes, he also is very desublimated or depoeticized, and the word choices around these issues, um, which can be illustrated by Basil. Uh, this is a, a little debate between, um, actually, Renata and myself. I use the word basil plant somewhere in this, I think it's in this section. Uh, it's not basil. It's not it's in there. Basil. Okay, but anyway, I say something like pesto, you know, making pesto from basil, basilico, that I might keep in my house. And Renata originally, I have to tattle, I have to do this. Renata originally translated that as plant. And I'm thinking, uh, what happened? Or Herb or something. And I'm thinking, wh why, why do you sort of, it became too generalized. And the thing was, romance languages, excuse me for, this is speak of overgeneralized, have a tendency to overgeneralize when they're given, uh, they, they, they re-abstract because poetry has to be poetic. But we have a tendency not to do that in American poetry. Not that it's not better or worse, it really is different traditions. Um, if we, if we want to say, you know, a hound dog, we won't just say a dog, we'll say a hound dog yeah. or something like that. And it goes on and on like that. Th and so, the, the zone between, the sort of um, betweenness of these two points, of the literariness of what you're, I mean, poetry is literary. Nobody would write a poem if there wasn't another poem before it. And any person who writes a poem is not doing it from nothing. They're doing it from Shakespeare, Dante, Wordsworth, you know, everybody, as many people as possible. So they have to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Lads and lasses, do you have any questions? Sorry. <laughs> do you have any questions regarding the first line and the point the translator was making about the gender? E se dopo tutto quanto una faccia giusto un elenco. What about that part? Which is your reaction? Martina. Maybe I put uh, a si dopo, no, ma si sente. Um, okay, uh, good morning. Uh, I will put a si dopo tutto quanto una facesse giusto. Uh, I will put le, the verb. I will change the, fo the form of the verb. 
And concerning the una, in Italian, uno in general represents a human thinking being. So maybe, uh, non lo so, io probabilmente lascerei uno se uno facesse in generale, perché nella lingua italiana mh, uno identifica un essere umano a prescindere dal sesso, ma comunque pensante. Vediamo se anche una può identificare un essere umano generale. Vediamo se le risponde una collega. Ivana? Lei? Valentina? Prego. I think that it is about questioning uh, the laws that we have in our language and so we have this tendency to use always uh, the male version of everything to uh, yeah and um i um, was in Erasmus uh, last semester and I studied the same uh, thing uh, in the German language uh, and uh, it's um, more difficult in uh, the German language than in Italian because they also have um, the, um, the fact that they derive uh, the uh, female words from the male one so um, we have a different suffix but it is O instead A um, sorry yeah A and instead in the German language they also have something longer so you have um, much more sense of the um, subjection of the female words from the male words but Okay, but uh, I was thinking about something different and uh, um, we talked about uh, uh, the um, different tendencies in uh, the different languages, so for example in the English one and in uh, Italian and uh, uh, French one, um, but how should uh, a translator work? So thinking about the target language and the culture of the people of the target language, or thinking about the culture and the tradition and the habits of uh, the first language? So I, I would say that Renata is going to answer now and then we will move on to the other draft, okay? Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, I'll, I've got a few things to say, I'm afraid. <laughs> Can I go back just one second to the question of rhythm? I mean, I see your point when you said you know, there's an alliteration here that's very strong. Daughter, dogs, desk. Mm. Okay, in, in Italian, we, well, we cannot have that. We cannot choose very simple words to translate um, the source and then and keep those sounds. So, well, okay, never mind. <laughs> but in, but uh, here, the question of rhythm was also, you know, yeah. Um, poignant, and she said, facesse, se una facesse giusto un elenco. I didn't want facesse because it, I want two letters, two syllables words. So there was, yeah, yeah, but here was a list of mm, words with two syllables. Dopo tutto quanto una faccia giusto. So there was this rhythm there somehow and of course rhythm and content go together because it's you know it's this flow of what you're thinking and what is all around you so it's not just timing it's right. not right. meter of course it's not even measure it's you know son the sonic qualities of the lines it's also drive. yeah One, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. Mm. Oh, oh. <laughs> and uh, I don't want I don't want to go into that dichotomy, you know, source text or target text, faithful or unfaithful. Uh, faithful or free, loyal to the spirit, loyal to the leather, domesticating, foreignizing, right. 
semantic translation, communicative translation, or visibility, invisibility, all sorts of dichotomies that we have inherited, mm -hmm. and that the very fruitful um, theories, yeah. But, I mean, they're not enough in this case. Um, okay, so I want to bypass that point, because I actually worked with something much more <sighs> magmatic, in, um, okay, uh, here, um, intertextuality was, you know, one of my key words, uh, because this work is made up of layers of work and of self-references, quotations, allusions, and so on. And I actually might, well, I had this, one of the few clear ideas <laughs> I had in mind when I started was, uh, having Rachel's poetry conversing with Italian poetry. Okay, so there was, uh, I wanted a di to create a dialogue in, so no hierarchy. Though, of course, there is a chronological order of composition, so her work comes first and then the rest. But um, uh, I wanted to um, sort of um, to pay homage to celebrate her own choice at you know uh, this um, sorry to repeating this this celebration of languages of language and styles and poetry uh, so basically um, my conversation in Italian it sounds really nice conversare, so make verses with, so was, you know, uh, taking into account a lot of poetry. Um, so um, I, I, when I translated uh, Dieci Bots, the, the, these 10 drafts here, uh, I read a lot of Zanzotto and Rosselli um, and um, even Fortini, you know, lots of Italian poets. Uh, so to create this network of meanings and to correspond, to address her own um, huge <laughs> poetic statements about poetry as being multi-layered and uh, so sorry, just another um, element, so rhythm intertextuality, and also the way texts are always floating, they are never fixed. We, are, we tend to think that at least the source text should be <laughs> stable, <laughs> at least. But the source text is never stable, it's not a monolith. Um, it changes, I mean, uh, uh, it changes with our interpretation, but with the author's interpretation as well. I had access to something invaluable, that is Rachel's mm, <laughs> conversation with me, okay? Um, not to her papers, I didn't have access to previous drafts of her dra poems, but we talked, we used to talk a lot, okay? Yeah, by email, but also, you know, I visited her uh, several times, so we were able to talk a lot. And you see here, there is evidence of our um, uh, online conversations. Um, so um, she was thinking about her Rome poetry again, and, and somehow, and I had access to, you know, the things she had in mind, when she was writing this, for example, or sh the things she had been reading, and you know all the literary references. So in this sense, the text is not stable. There is a deep, there are deep layers of texts beneath this. And so the original text is mobile too, is moving, and also the target text is you know, never finished, always ongoing. They're sort of floating. Annie. 
Oh, yeah. It's your turn. Well, yeah, uh, she practically said what I wanted to say. So first of all, <laughs> with the rhyme, um, I, I really think that the Italian language is, it keeps on rhyming. We have five vowels, all the words, and in five vowels. So it's like, you know, it's always a rhyme. Yeah. Uh, I remember, yeah, but too many rhymes, you know. When you want to write a poem that doesn't rhyme, you really have to break your head there, you know, trying to find some things. So it's not really that. I think that uh, what, what probably she wanted to highlight is the rhythm of uh, the English or American language, which are two different sounds, fundamentally, especially in poetry, that you can hear it. And... Um, but what um, Renata said, and this was uh, more or less my idea of introducing uh, Rachel. Um, Rachel wrote somewhere that uh, she has this love-hate relationship with Ezra Pound. I don't know if anybody has uh, studied Ezra Pound. I had to take an exam, and it's like, you know, I had these very thick books, you know, and every word had a reference. These were reference books. And uh, also in the poem that I chose uh, for this occasion, The Gap, we have so many references that um, this is The Gap, draft five, that um, yeah. Rachel highlights at the end of the poem. So uh, we have this intertextuality as Renate said, Renata said before and um, about translating uh, uh, trying to answer your question my idea is uh, I notice your beautiful comments with uh, Zanzotto and uh, all these Italian poets um, I don't really belong to this school I belong more to an American uh, poetry school and my idea is uh, to give back the style, to give back the word and the concept, rather than transforming into an Italian poetic style. Um, so we, we have two different approaches, although we are trying to do our best and try to, you know, <laughs> correct it by Rachel, and uh, thanks God, thanks God, because you're gonna see here how many how many problems we have fundamentally had? You can yeah, I I would just like to pay some homage to the fact that it's kind of what I was saying. If translation is interpretation, you're always choosing, and you're choosing. Is it rhythm that has to come forward? Is it perhaps it is rhyme, um, and you do it with the materials that you're given. English, as you probably know from looking at any dictionary, has lots of words. I mean, it really has really a lot of words compared to Italian. Italian, however, is more flexible from the point of view of syntax and verbs. That is, and sometimes sort of amazingly so, there are many more active tenses in, act, that is actively active in Italian when um, writing. There, the verb is packed with um, with everything, including the pronoun, which still really freaks me out. You, you know, you, it's all built in, a kind of a package. And furthermore, because the syntax is more is closer to Latin still than our Germanic, more Germanic syntax your syntax can move words around in a sentence more actively than English does, although I do do a certain amount of s sort of messing around with that. And so you have different um, ling language moments to deal with or language materials to deal with. And that said, at the same, you know, what I, I, I kind of wanted to say, yes, I'm very literary. Um, I think you're not writing poetry. Nobody is writing poetry without being on some level literary. Even people who claim they're not literary are totally literary. Okay, Allen Ginsberg, you know, he started, right? He just started doing it, forget it. He had a whole history of lots and lots of things that you can see, com there's no actual expression self-expression like you start from nothing because if you do that 
when you're a kid, you know, you write your first love poem because you're so besotted with somebody, you will discover very fast that you've just produced a mass of cliches because that seems original to you at that point. But forget it, you know. I've had students who the rest of the class said, oh my God, this is love poetry, this is like Sappho because of certain kind of tonality and so on, which we haven't even talked about tone, but never mind. Um, and, and she says, but I've, I don't even know who Sappho is. And we say, yeah, forget that. Y you have to go read Sappho because somehow you've recovered Sappho in some way by intuition, by your own or already existing literariness that you don't know. And now you have to inform yourself what this is that you resemble, okay? And so it's a back formation. So what if, one of the things that, Ren that Renata was saying was if you're literary, you have to be alert for layers of historical lexicons in each language, and it's absolutely true. Like, I have read Dante in my own small, pathetic way, and, you know, mezzo camin is very key. Um, if, you're, if you're literate in French modernism with Rimbaud, je ai un autre, right? And it's a very key, and if somebody who al can allude to that in their language, you have to respect that this comes from Rimbaud. That is, first you have to know, in effect, that it comes from Rimbaud, and either the author who is alive can tell you, or the author's essays, if the author is dead, can tell you, or you can, you know, you just have to figure it out. Mignon has an immediate key into Ronsard, you know, Mignon, allons voir, and so on. And so, then also I use, and a lot of American poets use, a lot of allusions to pop, much more than I do, even pop culture, but you know, to slang expressions. I start a poem with OMG, with oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, you know, so on. Or get real is the last line of one of my poems. And that has a certain feel in American language right now, at least it did <laughs> when I wrote the poem. Um, there are, there are, as you know in language, especially poetic language, poetic discourse, words that should not be used. Of course, they're now all used, but so there's a very complicated negotiation with bad words, curse words, slang words, sexual words in American poetry, which probably exists also here, but it may be a little more shocking here, I think, probably, yeah, I is. think it is. Um, it is you know, and so, you know, if you, if you use something like that in your poetry, you're making a very big choice of a powerful word, a real power word, where if you're an adolescent, you want to say every other word is merd, you know, or something like that, but you don't actually want to do that in a poem. There's a decorum at the same time that you want to be free to use any word you want. So negotiating all that as a poet and then negotiating all of that as a translator is very big lexical work. And that's what I want to say right now. And also there's the, there's a sort of, the static, there's endless nuance in a poem. As Andrea was pointing out by just saying, well, look at the word order, what do you get? You know, what's happening in the first line? Uh, you should say something more. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so let us try to grow some of the seeds they have thrown so far this morning, okay? Several points were made which I find of interest to you. Uh, this morning. So for instance, um, uh, Renata Morese was pointing out how she would rather disrupt the dichotomies we are quite familiar with. And, sorry, good. Um, the disruption of dichotomies recalls a crucial feature of Rachel Blood Plessis' poetry and poetics, which, is, which was called anti-binarism. Okay, that feature, that quality has been pointed out several times regarding her poems, and she may want to discuss about this later. And uh, another point which was uh, raised is the intertextuality, and I would like to ask Annie, possibly, whether that raised problems again when it came to translating those quotations, um, allusions, citations, references to, as we heard before, pop culture, British literature, and so forth. Uh, so how did she deal with intertextuality in translation, uh, which is always difficult? 
Um, then I would also like to uh, later to discuss about the idea of translation becoming not so much a new text as a development of a previous one, which again becomes ongoing, endless in a way. And that idea is not so new. If you think of the Finnegan's Wake, okay, by James Joyce, that text was meant to be endless. At some stage, Jimmy decided to stop it because he knew it was going to die quite soon. So in 39, she published that text just because he knew it was at the end of his days. Actually, he died in 1941, not that much later. And the very first thing she did, he did, sorry, uh, we are getting used to him. <laughs> the very first thing James Joyce did after publishing The Finnegan's Wake was self-translating it into Italian. As you might know, Joyce had Italian as the family language. He wanted his son and his daughter to speak Italian at home. That was their first language at home. And it self-translated Finnegan's Wake from English into Italian, as though that was the very first step of a continuation, which he felt to be essential to that text, which he also called work in progress, a text which was not meant to end. Anyhow, so uh, it's not so new as an idea. It's back to other uh, examples I may make, and is definitely uh, present, I believe, in your uh, poetry. So we may want to discuss about this ongoingness again. Uh, starting perhaps from Hani, okay? How did you deal with intertextuality? Well, yeah. Um, if you have examples to show to our students, and then they may have questions about. Yeah, I. Uh, um, this is it could be a lecture for an, an a couple of hours you know i'm going to uh try to make it very very short so at the end of this um draft uh we have the notes by rachel and i translated them into italian and then we have the little notes uh, that i did the translator's notes I will um, open this up so that you can see it better and we can read together. Um, so the deleted and blackened materials suggest the FBI files of George Oppen received under Freedom of Information Act when I was editing Oppen's, Oppen's selected letters. The little child self is from an... Um, Stefan Mallarmé, he wrote The Tomb of Anatole. Anatole was his second child. He died at the end of eight of rheumatic fever. So we have this point translated into English by Paul Oster, and this is the reference for Rachel. Then we have an activity, okay, just a word, and the reference is Regina Schwartz explaining interpretation. So we have the notion of memory as interpretation, which was recently taken by Mary Jacobus. Finally, we have It is Proper from Luz Irrigari. The black books, we have these two words, are by Anselm Kiefer. Uh, he's a German artist and was born in 1945. Someone is a dancer, Sharon Friedler, and um, uh, the form is uh, the one that occurs in Japanese music, but not only music, but also uh, in Japanese th uh, cinema, theater, no. Once again, we have the no theater as in Ezra Pound. And um, we have three stages. One is the introduction, ha, huh? the scattering cue, and the rush to finish. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Joel, the introduction, how the scattering and cue, the rush to finish. So inside we have these little points which are references besides everything. Also, um, the poem, uh, I chose it because I particularly like it, um, is uh, a dual poem, a dual at the beginning. We have two poems that at a certain point intersect. As we can see here, we have a, a long line that joins the two poems. 
and um, uh, the problem is um, how am I going to read this poem? How am I... Uh, up to a certain point, we do have two parallel poems, but then at a certain point they uh, move around. I have several references here, and we're going to read them together because they are quite interesting. One is by Thomas Devaney. He is talking specifically by uh, the central draft in drafts, the entire long poem by uh, Rachel. And, uh, but it, it can also be applied to this uh, draft uh, gap. Duplessis acknowledgement, he writes, that something else takes place is also a concession that the poem is not out there to master her shape-shifting discourse, but she is allowing the poem to take its own shape. She writes, whatever happens, cause fates and strange outcomes hard to own. So the poem, at a certain point, point becomes its own shape, its own poem. Um, another uh, interesting uh, comment is by Maria Damon. Uh, she is specifically um, considering drafts from 39 to 57. And um, uh, she writes here, which is quite appropriate for this poem, uh, Duplessis asks us to take seriously Olson's call for the poetry page. So the poetry page is seen as a wide open field on which historical, theoretical, social, and aesthetic problematics unfurl, twist, evolve, and mutate dialectically and or dialogically bouncing off each other in collision or play, interlocking in agonistic intensity or affectionate rapprochement. So we have, uh, you know, this enormous field with so many dialogical events happening inside. Um, I also, uh, since uh, Rachel before mentioned it, uh, uh, right before section three, I, I had to translate here. Let's put it a little bit bigger so that you can read it also. Let's see here. Here it is. I had these lines. This is the Italian, how am I? Here. And that is, and that it is. So, um, one small point, one of the smallest, if points had sizes, yet such that still can barely imagine its densities and extensives, if all could be factored and scatter, scattered over the breadth that is and that it is. Let's put it in Italian. Ciò che è e così è. I don't know, you know, it's very, very strange a little bit. Another uh, very strange uh, thing, and um, I'm going back to um, uh, Renata before. Uh, here where we have the passage of uh, the child. Um, we should really read at least this part. So photograph, here we have a blank, the gap. Uh, Rachel told me later it was written for uh, the departure of a relative. That's why we have very probably, this is the way Another thing that I wanted to say is that the translator projects, you know, um, it's not that I'm detached from my translation. I'm not even detached from Rachel's poem, you know, at this point I'm even part of this poem. And uh, uh, it's, it's very personal. I, I particularly like this poem because of so many other things that sort of are very close to my personal history besides everything. And um, so here we have photograph, a man within a day of death. 
estranged in light that flat flesh struck half holds his present. For me, this present was Kitiene. Uh, how did I put it down here? Um, uh, un uomo in un giorno di morti alienato nella luce così appiattito colpito al flash that's impossible for me to give back the beauty of these lines appena stringe il suo presente so we have this man you know in this day of the dead while present is a gift instead okay this is what she told me and a little bit further down uh, we have um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back here. Uh, we have eyes whitened behind glass, right on the edge. Let's a child rip it open. So the child is a bambina, and I translate a bambino, for example, and rips it open. I really straccia la carta per aprire il pacchetto. It's going to take me an entire paragraph, okay? So I had to write, di aprire il pacchetto. It doesn't give the idea, the images. Yeah, you know, I couldn't really give, right. right, okay. It's sort of just the opening. So, you know, so these are really things, you know, that put you flat there, you know. <laughs> what I did, I don't know what I did, but, you know, I had to do something there. That's often what a translator will say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. No, and the thing about the the egg, you know, the the I'm sorry. The, th you know, the thing about the the we only have one verb for being in English. It's like you are, you know, you be, being to be. Okay. But you have two, which is essere and stare, mm -hmm. which is interesting mm -hmm. actually. And in many ways I'm kind of toggling between those. I don't really like, I mean, Heidegger is really a problem to make a big segue. And so the capital B, like being, this kind of heaviness, is not where I really want to uh, do, do the language. But in many ways, I'm trying, I'm toggling s between essere and stare in my sense of this, um, it is. Uh, do you know what I mean? So, but, but there's no it, you know, that's still a problem. You guys have a problem with it. Would you like to say something? There's a question from the floor first. Uh, thank you for your conversation. It's very interesting. I have uh, a comment or a question, I don't know. It seems to me that there are two different experiences here. <laughs> One is the poet's experience with uh, openness, unlimited choice. And then you have the experience of the translator, uh, the experience of a limit. There is a limit. Uh, the language uh, you're translating in is limited in a certain sense. So um, I would like to hear your uh, ideas on these two different experiences, or am I seeing something wrong here? Oh. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't agree at all. I don't experience any limit. I experience a possibility. Um, there is this French philosopher, Maurice Blanchot, who claims that the translator is um, uh, the secret master of difference. Not because she abolishes difference, but because she makes it happen. She creates the possibility for to meet alterity, to meet who you are not yet. <laughs> so that was my experience. Um, and there was, this has to do with what you said about um, the text is always, is never finished. Did you say anything like this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, the idea that the text is always coming, I mean, it's never stable, it's never there. 
uh, there's always a negotiation, what we usually call choices, but in a, in a more open general sense, it is the negotiation between you know, this subject and you know all the echoes, all the contexts, all the the layers of languages. Uh, the author, of course, her work, everything is floating, and I, I like this a lot. <laughs> I mean, we always, I think we always translate, and of course we always read from where we are, from these networks of relations, we are able to activate from our knowledge, from our assets, from our values. but translation um, invites us to move forward. We do not know what is coming, but you know we open ourselves to that. Um, so it's not a limit, actually, no. <laughs> it is, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, recreating uh, the fact is that sometimes the original text is so good that your recreation becomes recreational and not poetic. You know, it, it's it's a little bit you know more uh, limited. On the other side, and this is um, uh, since I I wrote an entire thesis on Rachel. Um, at the beginning, you start collecting information, studying, and trying. Uh, because you have to limit someone. Okay, okay, this person is a symbolist, it's a constructivist, is a, um, and so you start, you know, building these tiny little uh, rooms uh, in order to define the person that you are trying to describe, when suddenly you discover that you are in front of a universe, this person is everything. And the poetry itself, maybe one draft is different from another, but you know, everything is inside. And so you are desperate. <laughs> That's <laughs> how I felt when I started, you know, the very first page, what am I gonna write now? And so you go maybe chronologically, you try to, I don't know, you know, enlarge this part and but anyhow, that's what we are dealing with. We are dealing with a universe with where there's absolutely everything. And from this universe, you try to transpose into another language that sometimes, as we said before, has different sounds because also sound helps so much to give you an emotional reaction. And um, so you have to find some ways and um, uh, very often we also played on uh, changing the meaning of the original words just only to have an alliteration inside the line because the sound was much more important than uh, the, the actual meaning of the word. And um, it's, as I said before, the fact that I worked with the author, with, with the poets, is... Um, uh, it's very important. How can you, as a translation, say, okay, I'm going to change this word. You know, I'm going to give the final one in a different language. So the fact that I, that, that the poet told me, oh, this is good, you know, well, that was all right. You know, <laughs> yeah, I no, I get. I mean, there's so many things to say actually in response, uh, and I will take up the question of limit. But it's also true that w the the fact that the poet can say this is s sort of the p specific reference is very helpful, but also the zone out of which the word comes. Is this a zone of seafaring or of Christmas present opening or is this so that you have a specificity of scene that that can lead you to etymology and the background of the language so that you can draw on the pool of your specific language choices. 
to to deal with the trans with the translation. So you want to stay within a zone, let's say, of seafaring if the allusions are sea are to seafaring, but you don't want to leap around as if it's then it's seafaring and then it's present opening and then it's eating your sandwich or something. You know, you want to have a consistency of interpretation, but if you can know that a certain word comes from that zone, then you can do a, a good job, let's say, of choosing a specific word that has, let's say, the Latin background that will allude to that zone. Um, yeah, in terms of limit and limitlessness, oh my God, well, we're back to the original question about the, lo about the long poem in a way. It's very hard to answer in the terms that you're, because you made a very nice binary and it really kind of works in one sense, do you know, that the, the, the poet feels limitless, especially because the work is long and it has these qualities. Um, but what happens when you're mm -hmm. writing it is that there's it, oh, plethora, muchness is a real problem for this poet, okay, and so, trying to make a, a work, the poem starts talking back to you, which is what, like the thing that you, were, you, you had just cited, that Annie had just cited. And the poet tries to listen to the poem, which is a, in many ways a completely nutty thing to say. It's pazzo, it's absolutely nuts to say that the poem is talking to you because the poem doesn't exist without you. So there's this very strange dialogue going on that people do talk about. The poem to a poet, at a certain point, the poem, the poem seems to have agency, but it doesn't. So, so it's, like, it's like, where is this coming from? You can say the subconscious, you can say your intertextuality, you can say many, many things, and they're all going to be true. But, but the poem starts to create its own limits, and you try to respond to the limits or the, 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 the path, really, that the poem is creating. It's not really a sense of limits, it's that this path is now the one, you know, the one that you're taking rather than that path. And that's why I have so many genres. Could we, can you c stick this in and we can maybe bring something up that I would like to show at this point, which I didn't, we, it shows how prepared we all are. We're prepared <laughs> enough. So much. I don't know where that goes. Well, let's try to, let's try to, and I can, I have to find, it's gonna be a key with a lot of stuff on it. Um, and I have to figure out which is, That's the third, wait a minute. Can I help? No, it's, I need to bring the whole, that whole thing. Yeah, here you go. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, the, the third, the page that you saw, the, the first one says grid of drafts, okay? The grid is a grid. Oh, my microphone, uh, sorry. I, I, don't, I can hear myself fine, you know what I mean? <laughs> no problem. Okay, so it goes like this. What, and I will repeat this tonight a little bit, but anyway, the first page said grid of drafts. The grid was not pre-thought. I had no plan. It, I, you couldn't possibly write a poem for 26 years if you had the same damn plan that you had at year one. Well, not possible. Do. Yeah, maybe Dante. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that, we're not, we're not in that, we're not in that. Okay, so everything was a discovery. That's why the sense of limit was never quite <laughs> present. Okay, so I don't know, can, can this be made bigger or no? I'm sure it not because it's a PowerPoint. This is, this is the grid. Um, okay, and it started with that blue line at the end. Okay, the top. 
Zurich. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, yeah. How do you make this bigger? Can you not make it big? Okay, anyway, this is very impressive. Even more if you want. How do you do that? Yeah. It's all very. I, I use a Mac. I don't use these kind of Dell, <laughs> Dell things. I can't Dell. figure that out. Like, uh. um, and, and so you can see that what's, what happened was the first two poems were it and she. And what I say about that is there's a lot of it out there, and she will have to deal with that, with it, okay. And then it just started, it was starting um, to be, oh good, how did you do that? Oh, uh, <laughs> I give you Annie, uh, who's the great, the master of the, oh thank you, oh bless your heart, okay, that's much better. So what happened was I just started writing the fir and I started writing and it was one thing to another. You know, first it looked like there, that it was going to be about prepositions, which is an interesting concept. And then the, I skipped a poem um, and that became the first gap. I just couldn't write it. And then it, it, I thought, well, that's gap. Okay, so. And then mid-rush is a pun on I didn't even know it was a pun on midrash at that point. It was like I was in midlife and I was in a rush. <laughs> the way we always, <laughs> I mean we are, bye. Um, and then it was, notice how late me comes in this. It's not about me. And then it was the, or the, depending, that's an interesting ambiguity uh, in English, the pronunciation of, the, of that word, the. So I say the, and then it was page, and then, it, you know, and it was, was going one to one to one to one. And then at a certain point down there, getting down there, there's also the first uh, interest in tra translation was I was working with um, some people in France who had a translation seminar much like this one where poets are working with poets and so on. And uh, so traduction, there's, uh, and it has a lot of French in it. And then working conditions, somehow this was work, I was working and it was, what was the, my working conditions? And then what happened was, I didn't know, I kept on saying to myself, I can't just keep on going one to one to one. This had taken about mm, a couple of years, you know, maybe seven. And so I thought, well, I'll start again, which was the great moment actually of draft. So I thought, well, I'll start again with, I will make a series and it was completely I can't even explain it. I thought I would do maybe every 20th poem or every, and what happened was I did every 19th poem. In other words, I changed in an odd number. So at ni the 19th poem, after the 19th I started, in keep it, or in chip it, with, uh, depending on how you say it. That is at beginning again. I began, you know, it begins. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'll just go across. So she, which has a touch of red in it, became cardinals, which is a red color and it's cardinal points and it's a pun on, your, on cardinals and stuff like that. And then of was sort of enmeshed, it's ofness, it's being among and between. And the Philadelphia Wireman is a, an Af probably an African American sculptor, he was actually an unknown artist who did wire, small wire um, uh, uh, sculptures and it, he just blew me away. So I did one on the Philadelphia Worm and then findings. And what started to happen was I thought, oh, look what I'm doing. So it started to go, I thought, at a certain point, and I had only done about 20 poems. Huh? How many of them are, how many of them are there going to be? And this is all like, kind of, duh. You know, I wish, could I do this? I thought, Okay, this is where the pound comes in. It's very important that I'm very indebted to pound and I am not glossing pound with my work. So because it, always a woman poet gets put under a male poet. Um, oh, well, she's just like pound. Well, forget that. You know, I'm not just like pound, including my politics are totally different aside from everything else. But of course, pound is very important for the long poem. And so what I thought, well, how many of them are there going to be? Well, pound said, he was going to do a hundred. That was in, when he was trying to imitate Dante. More fool he, but whatever. Um, and I thought, well, I have to do. I have to do a number that's like that. 
because you know this is a, 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 a well, there's a certain there's a certain kind of thing happening here. I said I can't do either pounds number, which was eventually one twenty seven, but a sec a sec. You know he kind of dribbles off, um, but I but where did that disappear? Oh, okay, bring it back. Um, I can't do a hundred because you can't do a hundred. That's for a lot of reasons. I, intuitive, not. And I can't do 127 because I'm not imitating pound, but I have to do a big number. So I thought, well, what's a big number? What's well, over 100? So what am I doing? I had 19, so I thought, well, what's a multiple of 19? This is actually true. This is a true story. What's a big number that's a multiple of 19? <laughs> and I thought, well, 114. That works. At, the to at that time, I had only written 20 poems. And I thought, well, what, uh, whatever, literally. I'll, I'll make it or I won't make it. I mean, I don't care. I, it would just happen. Well, ex so what, ha what started to happen at the bottom, of course, is all about work, right? Working conditions, Georgics, which is a work poem in shadow, workplace, Nakuya, Nakuya is a trip to the underworld, um, a work table with scale models, erg, erg is like ergon. Um, it's the measure of work in English, work, Work is measured by a Which measurement called ERG. How many of these are translated? How many of them are translated? Translators here who may be willing to translate. I don't know. I, I would have to do a little, a little thing. I mean and uh, well, you know, you're welcome to do it if you're good enough. <laughs> these people are good enough, right? And then it goes, all right. And then so at the end it was like, hey, I made it 114, but I had already screwed up. I had done this very deliberate thing. Around 57, I decided to make an unnumbered poem. And that's what, what is at the, uh, that's, 57? we had at between 57 and 58, down there, no, keep moving, moving uh, down. Yeah, yeah, I wanna just say, right there, 57 and then 58, I'm sorry about the up and down. Um, I, I decided to, uh, this is, they're all like intuitive, weird, formal gestures. I decided to summarize the poems that existed, which was 57 at that point. So I wrote little teeny fake sonnets, actually 57 little probably 100, sorry, 14 line poems. They're sort of sonnety. Some of I start using rhyme at a certain point. I mean, I'm not against rhyme. It's just, you know. It has a certain sound in English right now. And uh, so I wrote an unnumbered poem, which is actually a long poem. Fif 57 little sonnets is a long poem. And so I numbered it. It's like number 115, but, f but a fake number. It's really, quote, unnumbered. And so what I have in my final structure is 114 slash 115 poems, which is un unstable even in, yeah unnumbered precy, which is a precy of half the poem. It's not a precy of the whole poem. So I had to think, okay, am I going to write a summary of the other half of the poem? Yeah, you could do it. I mean, a summary of a poem is already a joke. It's a, it's a deep, deep, deep joke. You can't summarize a poem except by writing it all out again. So, so the fact of doing that is already a kind of self-joke on poetry, if I can put it that way, all right? And so, what, what happened was, I thought, well, no, I don't want to make this an even poem. An even poem would be that there's a summary in the middle and there's a summary at the end. No, I'm going to make it an uneven poem, which is part of the, an answer to your question. You know, it's going to have 114 poems, but it really has an extra poem, <laughs> which is unnumbered, so you can't really say it has 115 poems. And then I thought, well, I don't want to continue it. I stopped, but I didn't close it. And I stopped because I had reached this balance of even and odd that I allude to in part of the poem. Um, it, it's a thing. It's one of the motifs, let's say. And the motifs were all discovered heuristically, that is, in the process of doing it. So if you actually look, there are lots and lots and lots of words that allude to genres, to English genres or other genres. Um, but that's not all there is. Um, you know, like, mm, I'm trying to find one. Epistle is the f maybe the first one, or one lyric um, is one of them, or Renga down there at 32. Um, Renga is a, is a very nice Japanese form, which has prose poems 
No, sorry, Renga is the one that, that's high, but Renga is the one that's like a linked, uh, linked uh, haiku that used to be done in groups, so I make my own little group of me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or ballad and gloss, like um, Coleridge, like the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, he wrote the ballad, and then he, he decided to make a different kind of gloss. It sounds different. It looks different. It is different. Uh, and so I, d I draw a lot on poetic tradition, but I do it my own way, let's say. Um, yeah. My way, not <laughs> my way or the highway. Okay. And that, that's kind of, it's not an answer to anything. It's like to show the range. I mean, people have been alluding to some of the range, um, and it's just a way of, of pointing that out. Se avete domande, naturalmente, pensateci perché il tempo sì. stringe. Sì, perché forse hanno bisogno. Sto pensando un attimo. So, um, hi. Uh, um, I was listening to um, a Q&A um, you gave. I don't, I don't know exactly. I'm, I don't remember. But you were saying that um, it was on the list. Um, we had a page of, yeah. Okay. I don't know exactly, it was a long list. <laughs> okay, so you said, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that like um, you were trying to um, feminize the fact that there were like many, many, um, I, I'm trying to gather my ideas. There were many um, poems written in the specific like male version of the poems. And you are trying to, to say also that like male poems have a certain structure, they're like more rational, they're supposed to be more political. And like f um, and women are always like when they're bright, they seem like they're more like flattering or um, they're floating, they're not rational, they're not specific. Yeah. So I think it also has to do with the thing that um, the girl said before that a poet is more um, open in a sense, right. but you were taking it in an, because I was thinking before that she's right, because as a student, you learn that you have to um, accept what the author is saying, and then you have to, right. in a sort of way, interpret it, but you also have to stay very faithful. You cannot mess with the text. Yeah, if, yeah, if no, this, is all re this is a really good uh, re comment. All right. Keep going, keep going. As a student. And um, yeah, so I was also se seeing that like you gave it a really good structure because it's a difficult thing because you have an idea floating in your head. And I was also talking to Professor Binelli about this. Like I also tend to write, but like sometimes you have just a mess in your head, you have an inspiration, you cannot just put it down. So giving it this kind of structure, um, it may help to... Um, Right. Can I just respond to you? Because it's, it's fascinating. Many of the things that you said already could be taken. Um, it's like a very interesting splay. I actually, a long time ago, I wrote an essay called For the Etruscans, which was widely taken by those who widely took it, <laughs> which isn't everybody in the world, believe me, um, that to say that men are rational and women are not. I did not say that. I, I really, I didn't. I played with the idea of, um, of using a, non, a sort of non-rational, like you could say, irigare or something, sort of um, semi like, a, like a semiotic rather than a semantic, you know, heavy meeting structure as a way of speaking oppositionally. And what I said in For the Etruscans is many uh, groups, including at that point African, Africans using um, a kind of a sense of a pan-Africanness, um, many groups who are feeling oppositional, politically oppositional, use a critique within a binary, like they are rational. I mean, men are more, no more rational than women, honestly, they aren't. Um, women are not. It's a kind of training. It's like, so I, at this point, I'm much more, 
I, I never really believed that, although there's a tendency in early feminism to, to pose that binary again. See, they're that and we're this. And you know that kind of produced a mess in my view, but anyway, uh, which is why I'm not like Adrian Rich, uh, among other things. I don't like to produce that binary. I think that there are tendencies in, in, in gender for both things to happen. I think that male poets um, have been, are feminized, culturally feminized by cultural, you know, z z uh, I don't know, production. And that they often, male poets, accept that Swinburne does, Keats does, and so on. And sometimes male poets struggle against it very aggressively. Pound does, Olson does, so that men have to take up a certain relationship to their gender as it's been culturally p positioned within poetry. And I've written a lot about that, actually. I also think that women who have had fewer centuries of education and fewer centuries of being part of a cultural discourse that is taken seriously, can we say maybe three centuries, four centuries, you know, compared to the amount of time that people have spent on earth, which is more. Um, so women have had a, um, a problem within a cultural discourse of being taken seriously. Some women respond by being um, they say, I'm just being feminine and I'm just like, like Anais Nin or something like that, you know, some person like that. Some people respond by being hyper-rational and proving that they were within the same in, within the discourse as any man or something like that. I think that between this, right now we're in a zone or in a situation of, of queerness, of um, where, where people are trying to, quote, undo the binary. Well, good luck, says I. Um, this is extremely difficult to do. I think the best position to be in right now, um, you know, I, have, I really accept a queer position, but socially and within um, political discourse and within economic discourse, there is no queerness because you are, if you're a woman, you're paid less than a man, generally speaking. I mean, grosso modo, et cetera, et cetera. You go out on the street, you can be harassed. Yes, gay men are also sometimes, and, and trans men and so on. So, but the point is that betweenness and queerness are a very good position to take up within your, within a writing discourse, in my view. And I feel I've always tried to do that. That is, I'm a gendered writer who understands a lot about gender as, as you know, as uh, Giovanna was paying tribute to, and has analyzed culture via the, the lens of gender, which is a very complex lens and is culturally immobile also. I would never say that women write one way and men write another. You can just look at the, an anthology and you'll see that this is incorrect. The grid, the grid could be, if you're a feminist, a gynocritical feminist, the grid could, could be um, interpreted as a defensive move <laughs> <laughs> on my part, against the notion that women are irrational. I mean, there are many ways of interpreting my work in gender terms, honestly, there really are. What I actually said and what you quoted are slightly, you know, what I now would say in response to what I might have said are my maybe slightly divergent, it's quite interesting. I do have a few very explicitly feminist poems um, in, in, this, in this work. One is called Doggerel, and it's actually a, in rhyming couplets, uh, and it's very funny and very. Um, it, it it takes on uh, you know cliches around gender and sort of struggle. I also have a poem in a tribute to feminism and to rich, for that matter, which is um, draft. Uh, let's see if I can remember. I think it's yeah. Um, 49, turns and turns in interpretation, which tries to use a sestina structure, except that I, on, I, I don't use a sestina like the traditional. I use the word turns in every stanza. And then I do something that Zukovsky did, which is here's the poem and here's an interpretation of the poem. And it's very, very feminist work. It's a, kind of a history of the women's movement as I've experienced it. So I've done that, but I don't only write poems about a, with a kind of topic or an argumento of feminism. My feminism is much more uh, suffused within and, um, and um, not as explicitly, um, bin it's, ne it's not a binarist in terms of men are this, women are that. I really, 
even from the beginning. That was not a, really my position. And I, I'm very firm about that because otherwise you get into cultural messes of interpretation. No, so, I, I wasn't saying that no, you were dividing it. I was just pointing out how um, I see both of these, like the sort of male writing, more rational way of writing right, right. as it is in the uh, structure you gave it. And then in the more open sort of yeah. feminine writing, more like, I don't know, artistic or more like inspired kind of like right. romantic Va yeah, feminine. Vatic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, I right. see it like right. woven, like very together. I would be very happy to be a synthesis. In many ways, um, poets want to synthesize material and, and transpose it in a way. Yeah. Thank you. I'm afraid it's a bit late and do you mind to close the day workshop or am I asking too much? I've seen people were now. kind of yeah. Yeah. People have classes between it's a pity. five. Yeah. Oh yeah, do, do come back. Something? It'd be fun. <laughs> no, I'm happy enough with this. I mean, it's a pity because we, we, we do have several yeah. topics yeah. to discuss about. Well, okay. I think we could stay here for hours, but I want to respect your time, your time for lunch and your time for other classes before we resume this conversation at 5 o'clock, and I hope to see you all again. Um, please let me close by saying what I really want to bring home, what I want to, what I want to keep uh, for the future, at least for this semester and that has become and grown very dear to me. It's gonna be scattered ideas, but what I appreciate about these three uh, women uh, here is their um, irreverent freedom, uh, the disobedience to any kind of taxonomy, any kind of preconstituted grid rule that may predefine our thinking. This is writing as thinking, which is what students who know me, I always say that's what we do. Even when we write an academic essay, sit down and see where the interpretation goes. That's, that's the gift of writing. Writing as thinking both uh, as a poet and as a translator. And uh, let me bring Adrienne Rich closer to you because I really want to disrupt also this uh, by now stifled dichotomy. Uh, poetry for Adrienne Rich is the what if. Yeah, that is true. Let us sit down and see what happens. Uh, yeah. Let us uh, leave that taxonomy open. Even the grid is not a grid because it's organic. Yes. It is not, it's not the map <coughs> before you go explore. It's the map that is, uh, you know, it's praxis uh, and theory that come together, which is so essential for our being in the world responsibly, not dividing praxis from, right. from theory. And that's where gender becomes important, not as that, as that binary which is given beforehand, uh, but as the constant taking the risk of queering that binary, which sometimes is only discursive, because in practice, uh, you know, statistical data divide us between men and women. This is dead, but I can speak loudly. Uh, statistical data divide us between men and women, and Rachel is right to point out uh, that, uh, you know, according to the latest uh, According to the latest uh, yeah. um, data released by the World Observatory, in Italy it will take us women another 220 years for our stipends to meet uh, uh, the stipends of men. 220 years is a long time, even for those of you who are younger than me. It's too long not to react against it. Call it feminism, call it what you want. It's women's rights that we still need to defend. 
But this said, I want to think much more freely than that. I do want to think within the queer paradigm that is uh, much more open. And uh, I don't want to reduce it to Americanness. Absolutely not. But Americanness is what I have spent my life studying, is what I know. And uh, a poetry that begins uh, together with Whitman and Emily Dickinson, with that endless organic poem and that endless sequence uh, that, you know, you always say, Dickinson is not one lyrical poem. Is you pick and choose among thousands. Uh, that's uh, the disobedience uh, that creates a poetics uh, that is a political doing because it is theory and praxis together. Imperfect, yes, fragmentary, moving together. Is there anything more imperfect than feminism? Feminism is a fight, it's a rebellion, it's a revolution that never killed anybody, that doesn't even want to kill men. It's absurd. It rests on nonviolence, which is a loss by definition. But it keeps going, generation after generation, you know, through this. And that's what poetry is not a luxury, Audre Lorde. That's what poetry is very much needed, very much at the center of our thinking. Because poetry is that sitting down, let's see where we go. Let's take the risk to think together. Me, the poet, you, the reader, you, the interpreter, you, the translator. It's a mess, but that's life. And have a good lunch. And thank you very much. Thank you.